Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I am your host, Sarah Powers, here today without my co-host, Megan Francis, because I am bringing you one of our Voices interview episodes. It's actually the first one of the new year. So for new listeners, first of all, welcome. We're so glad you're here. The Mom Hour is not an interview-based show as its primary format, but on the first Friday of every month, we bring you a conversation with someone other than the two of us, like an author, an expert, a fellow podcaster, somebody who can bring something to the table that we can't. We take turns doing those interviews. So next month, you will hear Megan chat with somebody amazing. And this month, I am thrilled to be talking with Sarah Hart Unger, the co-host of the Best of Both Worlds podcast, which she does with Laura Vanderkam. Sarah is a full-time working mom of three, in addition to co-hosting a podcast about working motherhood. And she and her husband are both physicians. So they have really demanding work schedules, uh, three young kids. And Sarah is a kind of a wizard when it comes to planning and goal setting and using her planner and how she manages her tasks and to-do lists. It's all stuff that I love to talk about too, but, but I am a total novice compared to Sarah and I'm really excited for you guys to hear from her. I loved hearing about how Sarah uses her planner and about her ideas for making the year ahead really fun and productive, but also in alignment with your values as a mom. It doesn't really matter what kind of planner person you are, paper, digital, none of the above. I think you'll really enjoy seeing how someone with a ton on their plate does it and keeps a good sense of humor about it at the same time. Sarah, you know when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming a new sponsor today, Dr. Mom Butt Balm. Sarah, this might sound a little weird, but when my kids were babies, I actually really enjoyed changing diapers. It felt like a little time out to connect. Oh, yeah, Megan. I can totally remember that feeling of just kind of leaning in and enjoying a little moment in your routine. Yeah, but when my babies had diaper rash, it made the whole experience so much less fun for both of us. 
And back in those days, we didn't have great options for rash cream either. It was usually goopy, heavy, and full of dyes and preservatives and other things I didn't really want to put on my baby's butt. Well, the creator of Dr. Mom Butt Balm, who is a mom and also a doctor, had the same experience, Megan, and she did something about it. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is free of dyes, preservatives, and zinc oxide. It's easy to apply, easy to remove, and you don't have to use a lot to protect your baby's skin. I really love the way this balm feels. It's almost like a high-end skin cream. Very nice, no strong scent, and definitely nothing like the diaper rash creams I used to struggle with. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Happy New Year. Hi, I'm so excited to be on. Happy New Year to you, too. Yay, I'm really excited about this. What perfect timing to talk about planners and planning with a fellow kindred spirit who really likes to geek out about these things. So I am very excited. And of course, listeners heard me mention that you are the co-host of the Best of Both Worlds podcast. Um, And so many of our listeners are probably familiar with you already. But if they are not, why don't you just tell everybody where you live, who lives in your house with you, and what you do as a working mom for a living? Yes. So I am a mother of three. I have a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. We live in South Florida, actually a little western suburb of Fort Lauderdale called Cooper City. Okay. And I am a pediatric endocrinologist. And I also actually run a pediatrics residency program at the hospital where I work. So my job is sort of part clinical and part administrative. And then in my spare time, which you can imagine (laughs) I have tons of, no, um, actually I do have some time, which is part of why I'm so passionate about planning and intentional use of time that I wanted to, yeah. Um, But I I have a podcast, which you mentioned, that's so much fun that I do with Laura Vanderkam. Um, It's our labor of love and we we have an episode every single week. And then I also uh, write in a blog pretty frequently too. That is a lot. Um, How, what is your, like, how much are you working uh, in your practice and at the hospital? Are you, you're full time, correct? Nearly. I'm actually okay. 0.9 FTEs um, okay. <laughs> because in order to have some daytime sessions to record the podcast, uh-huh. I can't really double dip from work time. So that 0.1 FTE amounts to two days per month that I can spend doing podcast episodes. Okay. And other than that, yes, full time. So that is yes. a ton and your kids are at fun, but definitely still the trenches ages with a two-year-old at home. So yes, hats off to you, my friend. (laughs) My kids are like your kids, like several years ago. You know exactly what I'm going through. Yeah. When I, when Megan and I started this podcast, because in our first little intro, we said, hi, I'm Sarah. My kids are two, five and seven. And I remember I had (gasps) rounded up because there's a time of the year, actually right now, there's a time of the year where they really are stepping stones. So at the minute of this recording, they are, nope. I lied about that. They're going to be 7, 9, 11. So it's after January that they go into stepping stones for a few months. Um, No, I get that. In fact, if I were being really complete, I would have said two, almost six and almost eight. Yes. You know, you get it. (laughs) Yes, I get it. And I have been there. So, well, again, welcome. We're so excited. And we're going to dive in um, and talk about planners and planning. So I'm going to assume right now, this is coming out in the second week of January, that um, our listeners have some kind of a calendar or a planner or some kind of system they've used before, because of course, you know, we're, we were all moms last year. Um, so rather than start with types of planners or types of systems, let's just assume everybody's got a system. And I kind of want to talk about um, how we set up that calendar or that planner for the year. Um, I'm always tempted to like, like, I don't know, spread everything out on the floor and see it all at once. Um, but I know not everybody's like that. Do you have some thoughts on Um, This time of year, some good ways to look at the year ahead and kind of put those rocks in, as Megan and I would say, or just your approach to that? Definitely. So, I mean, I think there's no one right way and your personality type is definitely going to dictate how you choose to do this. I certainly start thinking about the year ahead way before January. (laughs) So so not that this uh, is too late for a recording, but usually starting around September, I start to get a lot of work invitations or other things that are happening in the next calendar year. And I actually, um, my method as of late has been to print out pages with two months per page on them where I can 
kind of use them as a skeletal tracker going forward. So I can start putting in like, oh, there's this big concert that's coming in March or there's this work conference that I know I want to go to in February because um, it's really funny. You know, when it's July, you don't think twice about planning something in October. Right. And yet when it's November, February seems like worlds away, but it's it's actually not. So when you print it out um, and they're side by side, is it just from like from a digital Google calendar or from something like uh-huh. does it look like a grid? Yeah. So I, um, there are so many different ways to do this. And I know that many of you love your digital calendars and I use digital calendars for different things, but I always have a master paper planner that integrates everything. And people may think I'm crazy, but it works incredibly well for me. And I'm not going to brag, but there are multiple times when I will be the only one who knows when an actual meeting's been because it got moved five times and nobody kept up with like the Outlook invite and it's showing different locations. But because each time I actually just wrote down what people had said that I have the accurate information. So even though I use those digital tools as references, I always have one master plan all on paper. And I think that probably more people could benefit from that than actually are doing it lately. So that's one soapbox I might stand up on. Well, no, I, I I like that. And and we'll get in later. I think I'm probably like the inverse of you. I think I'm master digital with lots of paper support. So it, that'll be interesting to talk about a little later on. We're probably, we, I think we both probably rely on both, but maybe with inverse proportion. So, okay. Continue. Yeah, I absolutely see the value of both. And I think, I yeah, think me too. most of us in this day and age, there's no real way to get away um, from the digital. And I think it serves a really important purpose, especially with communicating with others. Um, but I guess what I actually have is like, yeah, it looks like calendar months. I usually uh-huh. print them off from like a free, like that time and date.com or some other right. calendar resource. Um, just cause that's a compact way of seeing it, but any more than two on a page is like very cramped. So, and the reason they're not going into your planner yet is because it's still the prior year and you're not operating out of Correct. your, your master, um, hard copy. Yeah. Okay. I get it. I'm following. So then um, as I'm building those in the fall of the year prior, there does have to become kind of like a day or a moment of reckoning, right? Where you decide on your next year's planner and you put everything ceremoniously in and really take a global look at what you want to do that year. And you could certainly do this gradually. Like you could spend a half hour per night, a few nights, like really, you know, getting the, the months all in there. But I really enjoy doing like a half day kind of personal retreat type of a thing where I really think about the, you know, the travel that I want to do with my family and um, my big goals for the year and how they might fit in um, and sit down and kind of dump all those um, engagements that are theoretical um, mm-hmm. before they hit that year's uh, planner into the the year's planner itself. So I think it's a great um, way to force yourself if yeah. you know that you're going to be spending time putting on to, to hard copy in the paper that you're going to be using for that whole year um, to really choose intentionally what's going to go in there. Yeah. And actually, I uh, just a, a vote for it not being too late at all, even though you started kind of thinking about it a couple months ago. I actually think like we get kind of a two or three week grace period in January as everybody gets their bearings. Um, and unless you have some big family trip or birthday or something in the first couple of weeks of January, you you really do have, I think, some time this month to think about the year ahead. So um, I love that. I was going to ask when, uh, if or when you bring your partner into this process. Um, just a quick aside, Brian and I took like a one night little staycation when we were uh, over the holidays and it didn't, it wasn't supposed to be a calendar planning retreat. It was actually because we needed <laughs> one more night at a Marriott property to maintain our status. So it was motivated by something totally different, um, but it happened to be December 30th. And I was like, oh yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. And I don't think that's my what my husband really like had looked forward to in a getaway. But um, so how and when do you include your partner in this process for things like vacation and travel and things like that? So I absolutely love that you (laughs) did a partner retreat on December 30th. I actually wish that we haven't done ours yet, which is terrible. Like for me, this is we're late because I would much prefer to do it at the end of the year. But you're absolutely right. There is this lull in January and everybody has all this fresh new energy. So it's a perfect timing to be doing it now. But we do something very similar. We tend to do date nights. I try to do them almost every month where, where we sort of 
um, well, we do date nights more than every month, but one date night per month is dedicated to mostly administrative things. We look at our finances, we look at upcoming vacations and towards the end of the year or the beginning of the next year in 2020, um, we really lay out like, okay, these are the days that we're going to request vacation. And these are where we want to do our big spring break trip or summer trip and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think these meetings are best held, you know, with a glass of wine or, you know, in another relaxing setting, like your hotel is perfect and without a rush, like yeah. you can't sit down for 30 minutes and plan out an entire year. It's right. not going to work. Yeah. Um, just to share, and I don't know how your kind of like goals and family values fit into your calendar planning, but I see them as really related. And just to share how it worked for us, my husband isn't particularly calendar oriented, but he's very experience and values based and oriented. So like when we come together, we'll talk about things like I really want to see more live theater and more live events in general in 2020. That's kind of a goal, but I don't have them all on the calendar yet. So we kind of write that down. And, you know, he loves the Cubs and they they only come a couple of times a year to Southern California. So we kind of write that down. We don't know the exact dates yet. Um, and even things like we do a big East Coast trip every other summer. Um, and we realize that we've never taken time to tack on um, a big city like Boston or New York. Um, and the kids are old enough for that now. So it's like, it wasn't just calendar planning. It was also like it, this little bit more values based or goals based discussion. I don't know if it's like that for you guys, but for us, it definitely is. And and that's credit to him, too, because I could be the one to just want to get right to the schedule and plug everything in. Yes, my husband is. I mean, he's enthusiastic about most things. <laughs> so I'm really lucky in that it's very hard for me to come up with something I could mention that he wouldn't say, like, let's do it. So actually, it tends to be him suggesting 90,000 things and me being like, okay, well, let's remember what's realistic because yeah. we do have a two-year-old. Like, we're not going to go like spelunking or something. <laughs> um, but um, but yes, I think that there's that, you know, important balance and intentionality and it doesn't necessarily have to be plugging in dates, but absolutely plugging in what's important. And for me, I mean, you sort of mentioned family and work. I think it's so important to be having that discussion together with both of those things in mind. Like my yeah. work is very important to me. My family is my number one priority. So, you know, I can't just sit down and plan out work conferences by myself. And I can't just sit down and plan family things I want to do. I really have to look at both together. Yeah. So the only way to do that is to kind of do my preparation, have what I have in mind for work. And my husband's a physician as well. So our call schedules make things um, extra complicated. But it also forces us to be really intentional. So in yeah. a way, I think there is a, you know, a benefit to the limitations we have. And I hope we put them to good use. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I actually think when you have more structure uh, built into your schedule, it does, like you said, it forces you to put in, you know, the days the kids are off of school and you're both working full time. So like you have to think about those things weeks in advance in a way that Others may not, but yep. that then kind of opens you up for the freedom of looking at the year as a whole and deciding what to do. Um, so I'm very curious about this idea of quintiles, in part because I never hear that word used, but you you look at the at the year in yes. fifths, right? Okay, tell me all about this. Yes, and I think a lot of parents are going to find this relatable. So I didn't make up the word because I did Google it and there have been other mentions of quintiles, although I was a little disappointed because it would have been cool to come up with that concept myself. Um, but here are my five quintiles of the year. Number one is January 1st to spring break because I feel like the beginning of the year always feels like the start of something, right? Yeah. And it's always kind of a big push. You know, kids are back at school after winter break. There's a focus on academics. There's not a lot of time off. There really aren't a lot of big holidays during that time. So right. you're just kind of focused. Right. Um, and then spring break opens up that kind of like end of the school year energy. Like, yep. okay, we have two months to go. There's going to be end of school projects. There's going to be, now I'm starting to see testing. Ugh. And then there's spring break itself, right. which, you know, the older my kids get, the more I'm like, these are really important to maximize these vacations as families because we get a limited number and the kids really can't be out of school when yeah. it's, you know, randomly. So, um, uh, it may be, I'm sure this is very different for those um, doing homeschool, but for those with traditional school schedules, yeah. it really feels like a second segment of the year. Then there's summer, right? And summer, of course, deserves its own quintile. And that lasts from the end of the school year. So in Florida, that's actually like very beginning of June because we have a fairly early start and early end of the year mm -hmm. until um, school begins again because school dictates everything, right? right? So all of summer is the kids camp and your summer vacations and whatever you're going to do. And then the beginning of Q4 is that back to school schedule. So um, it begins 
for us in mid-August. Yeah. So I, I guess, you know, for those East Coasters that begin in September, maybe they can lump that all into one quintile. But for me, if my quintile begins my or my segment like begins in mid-August, I, I just feel like towards the whole end of the year, like yeah. that is just too much. And I feel like um, the time from Halloween until December 31st has its own yes. special energy. I agree. Like it's like that reflection and it's holiday and it's celebration. And there's usually another like big time off of work in there. So that's Q5. So um, I know a lot of people love to do quarterly goals or yearly goals. And I do um, yearly goals as well. But I really like to look at my goals in terms of um, what I'd like to get through each quintile. Okay, so I'm obsessed with this. We have to talk about this more. First of all, (laughs) it's really smart because it doesn't it's not. um, tied to a specific date, but like you said, more around the school year calendar. So for our homeschooling or our moms who don't yet have kids in school or, you know, empty nesters, it might not apply. But for so many of us whose lives are tied to the school year, your quintiles would look slightly different from mine because they're based around these sections of the year. So first of all, how did you like, did you just come up with this on your own? Yes. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So remember, I do a podcast with Laura Vanderkam, who is an amazing time management guru. And um, she does a planning method where she does things in quarters. And for I just had this moment where I'm like, this does not work for me because it's just not right with the school. And that's when I came up with quintiles. And then when I thought of it, I'm like, this works really well. So it stuck. No, I love it. And I also love I was as you were talking through, I thought, how is she going to what are the fourth and fifth? What's going to be the um, demarcation line between the fourth and fifth. And I was thinking, is it all the way to Thanksgiving? But how you're right. Like Halloween is such a November 1st is such a turning point. Um, and Halloween itself with school celebrations and sometimes there's parent teacher conferences around there. Like you're right. That is another, um, it's a special quintile and it's like one of my favorites. Cause it's usually like, that's when I order my new planner. It's when I just start thinking about the next year and start reflecting. Um, yeah, it's just got a nice special energy to it. I love it. Okay, so you mentioned annual goals and quintile goals. Do you want to talk a little bit about your um, goal setting process? Are these goals just for yourself or for the family, work? Um, how does that work for you? Yeah, there's so many different ways to do it. This year, I actually decided to do the um, um, Gretchen Rubin and her famous 18 for 2018, 19 for 2019. Uh-huh. I never jumped on that bandwagon, but somehow 20 for 2020 was just so enticing. How could I not? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I did make my yearly goals that way, which means I didn't really divide them up by area. But typically for each quintile, I do come up with kind of different areas of life and where I would like to meet different goals. So I have a personal area, a family area, a blog slash podcast, and then a work. So those are kind of the four um, segments. And then I tend to make goals within each of those um, realms for the quintile. And then I'm really big on like, and it's, it sounds like so much like when I write it down, but when I do it, it feels fairly natural, but basically parsing my goals from big to small. So Mm -hmm. as I create my quintile goal, I pull monthly goals from those quintile goals. I might also add some other things that make sense for the month. Like if I know I have some specific report due for work, or I know that there is a poster submission for a meeting that I want to go to, that might go on a monthly list. But I really look at the quintile list when I'm making my monthly list. And I look at my weekly and uh, my monthly list when I'm making my weekly list. And I look at my weekly list when I'm making my daily list. So yeah. really, it sounds like a ton of lists. And I guess it is. <laughs> um, but that is how I function. And it really works incredibly it, well for me. It works so well. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution, Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. 
To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, I'm back here with Sarah. And um, I think I need a visual, Sarah, of your planner. And I know we've stayed away from like recommending a specific brand because any can work. But why don't now, why don't you tell us what you're using for 2020? And you mentioned that you have uh, kind of your master planner, which is a physical paper planner. And then you also have like a bullet journal on the side. Tell me how that works. Yeah. And I'm happy to send a picture so that you can share it on your Instagram feed um, so that everybody can see it. Because I do feel like visual is so important with planning. In fact, I will say that um, I've gotten so many incredible ideas just by like if you search Instagram for planning or like planning or bullet journal, um, you will find so many interesting things. And I feel like I've my techniques really come from taking little bits and pieces of what other people have done over the years. Yeah, that's really smart. Um, yeah. So the planner that I use is um, actually it's called a Hobonichi Techo and it does come from Japan. You can also order them through Amazon or from JetPen. So you don't have to ship it all the way from Japan if you're not crazy. But I really <laughs> enjoy the ritual of doing it. Um, my planner, the reason I love this one, and there are probably others with some of the features that this has, but it has monthly pages, weekly pages and daily pages. And there aren't a lot of systems that actually contain all three. And the reason it can contain all three of these without being giant is because the paper is really, really thin. It's like the special magical paper called Tomo River paper that comes from Japan that doesn't bleed through. And yet, like, if you looked at this book, I mean, it's the size of like, like a smallish to medium sized paperback. Like it's not gigantic. Is it? um, How wide and tall are we talking? And I will share a photo in the show notes. But like, like it's not, you know how some are, are large, but flat. I'm picturing yours is a little bit thicker, but it's smaller. It's it's like an inch thick. Okay. It's like much less thick than you might imagine with all of those pages. Right. You, it gets thicker over the course of the year because I guess as you write on it and the pages wrinkle, it gets a little uh. thicker. Um, But it's like, it's about an inch thick and it's about, let's say six to seven inches on the bottom and okay. maybe like nine inches. Okay. I think it's like a a five size, okay. not okay. A, a four is bigger. So okay. Yeah. So it's not huge. And then I mentioned bullet journal and I don't have like a whole separate like big like lectern notebook like some people use. But this same brand makes like a really small, thin notebook um, that has the same type of paper in it. Mine only has 48 pages. So it's really, really thin with this type of paper okay. that kind of tucks into the side. So it really is like all of it could all be in one book. It's just not. Um, so again, I'll have to post a picture because yes, it's will. hard to visualize, but like a thin pamphlet night like notebook that goes with it. But I actually find that very important because there are things that I like to track on separate lists that I just don't have room for because the whole planner itself is dated. So yes. I don't want to like randomly use January 22nd because then, you know, what would I do on January 22nd? So I'm going to use this time to jump in and explain a little bit about what my system looks like just because just yeah. for listeners. Um, I love hearing systems. Okay, by the well, way, so, and yes. I feel like my system is not as systemized as yours, but I, I think I'm five or six years running with one of the Moleskin notebooks. Um, I have a very specific one. It's the, it's called the classic. So it's the classic size uh, for the Moleskin notebook. It's lined, not dotted. Some of them are dotted or like a graph paper or blank, but mine is lined, and it has a soft cover, so it's it's pliable. Um, it's pretty thin and it's completely blank. So I actually don't use a paper calendar planner, but that red, I call it the red book. It's been red the last two years. I've had a couple that were like a pretty sea green. I was weirdly on the fence for 2020 if I wanted red again or go back to the sea green. They only make this particular moleskin in black, uh, kind of this teal or red. Um, You can find other (laughs) variations. Like if you want the hardcover, you can get a different color. Or if you want the dotted pages instead of the lined, you could get a different color. But with my specifications, it's only those three colors. And I actually ended up buying both, which is so silly. Um, but I went with red. So that red book becomes kind of my book for the year, but very different from you. It is not, my calendar is entirely digital. And then I've mentioned this on the mom hour a million times, but I actually print my weekly Google calendar on Sunday. And then I mark it up the way you'd mark up, like you're editing a document or something. So it's, it's captured digitally. The master, the master brain of the calendar is all digital, but that piece of printer paper folds up and goes in my notebook for the week. And that sort of becomes my paper planner for the week. And last year, for the first time, I actually saved them all. And I tucked them in the back of the Moleskin journal. It has a little uh, flap folder in the back. 
And and I thought I got them all out the other day and I thought, I don't know why I saved these, but there's something like they're really messy and like I'll cross out appointments and move things around. Like when you were talking about meetings moving and stuff, it's something about as of Sunday, I move from mostly digital to mostly paper because that that one pager becomes my guide for the week. And so they're not pretty. They start out looking like a printed Google calendar and they end up marked up all over the place. I'll make notes on the back. And um, but that's that's the way it works. And so the notebook itself becomes more like a to do list slash journal slash. I know we're going to talk a little bit about tracking things or keeping things, you know, writing down things throughout the year. So that's really how I use the journal. And then the calendar kind of slips in. So that's my system right now. I love that because I can see why throughout the week you having the printed page gives you something to work from. I actually think I could I could survive with that. <laughs> you could awesome. do it. You could if do I it. had to compromise and couldn't have all my months in one page, um, I, I still I think the act of putting everything onto paper month week it makes me like make more choices. And yeah. because I'm like integrating really different realms, I like that layer of control. Yeah. But I also totally see the benefit of how you do it. And maybe if I felt like I had like fewer jobs. I don't know that I, that that might work more for me, <laughs> totally. but I love that. I love the printout um, is key because yeah. there is something, do you do a daily list of sorts? Like do you do a page for each day that kind of has your priorities? Is there anything? So I wanted to ask you about to-do lists and now's as good a time as any. So I keep a running to-do list divided up by area of my life. So I have running the mom hour and then our sister company Life Listened, which is also podcast related, but not here at the mom hour. So I have those two businesses I have a list for kind of miscellaneous personal that would be like make a doctor's appointment or RSVP to an invite or whatever. And I have a list for the kids school that includes my kind of voluntary stuff or maybe something else going on with the kids school. And when I open up that moleskin, it's like a it lays really nice and flat. So I have two pages side by side and I'll start those to do lists. And it's not even for the week. It's really for as much time as I feel like I have the space. And once it feels too cluttered or I've or I've checked most of the things off. I literally just turn the page and start over. So I I am not 100% happy with my running task list. I have often wondered if digital would be beneficial to me with tasks, but I'm I'm very much paper when it comes to tasks, which is so interesting because I'm, I'm more digital when it comes to calendar. So I am very curious for you. I, I feel like I can conceptualize your calendar planning system, but when when a thought pops into your head and you're driving to work and you're like, oh, I need to return that call or sign that permission slip, where does that go? So, well, it varies, but I would say the two places it goes are either into my email, which I'm religious about trying to get to either empty or at least down to like 10 items, like one screen every single Friday um, or sometimes Sunday, (laughs) depending on if the week is crazy. Um, Or it goes into my physical paper planner, either tagged to a specific week or even a specific day. If it's something that like maybe yesterday, I think I had on there, like contact Sarah about podcasts and you did hear from me, right? Because (laughs) I get really overwhelmed when I see everything at once. Like I don't want a master list. I don't want to look at 30 things. I will freak out. I am too anxious of a person. So it actually helps me to not see it all and to only see it when I need to see it. And so I really use my calendar to place tasks in there. And I actually felt really validated because I was listening to a um, a great podcast episode this morning. It was the Her Money podcast, and they had Julie Mer- Morgenstern on as a guest. Okay. Um, and Julie is like another like very master organizer, and that's what she said she did. She's like, all of my tasks list tasks are tagged to specific places on my calendar. So I think she uses a digital calendar. So maybe you could think about some way of putting some of your tasks embedded into Google Calendar. I don't, I'm not a guru on how that would work, but I actually put my tasks embedded into my paper planner. And again, since I do clear my email out every week, if there's something that's like languishing there, I figure out where it needs to go time-wise into my paper planner. Like if it's like, oh, I got this email from school about registering Genevieve. That's my little one for next year, which I have that. I get it out of my email and I know it's due like in February. So I put it the week before and was like, okay, get it done. I put that on my paper weekly planner and I do have a weekly, again, I have monthly task lists and then weekly task lists. And it also helps me because there is a fairly limited amount of space. And honestly, if I'm trying to put like more than 12 things in a given week, that's very unrealistic. (laughs) So it means I should probably look for another week or do it now or, or even figure out like if there's like a half day I have off of work that I might want to do more of a power hour than to put it there. Yeah. So I definitely feel like this is uh, an area for me that could use an overhaul. I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way I look at my, you know, the first half of 
our conversation today talking about putting the things on the calendar for the year that you want and even setting goals like those as you were talking, I was feeling like, yeah, I, I think my systems are either similar or I feel good about them. But uh, task list management and the way tasks interface with calendar planning, um, it's I mean, it has worked. Obviously, I've gotten a lot done over the last four years. But- you get a lot done. So give yourself <laughs> some credit. I wonder if you're just stressed out by seeing too many tasks, like seeing more tasks than you need to see. And maybe maybe you need like a urgent tasks and like a yeah. later tasks. No, no, you're totally right. I mean, you're I think from if, of all the management and, you know, time management things I've read over the years, I think you definitely are using best practices. And I am not. I think what I worry is that where, where, where my anxiety comes in is that I will forget to put them somewhere. Like by putting them all in one place where I can see them, then I won't miss one. So it's just of the You have to know that same. you're like, yeah. like for me, I feel very confident because I know I use my paper planner religiously. Yeah. So I, if I know that I have to do something on January 2nd, as I did yesterday, there's no chance that I'm not going to see that because right. every day part of my routine is looking at my planner and looking at my to-dos. If I'm not a consistent planner user, then you're right. That would be terrifying because yeah. you'd put it there and then like maybe it would disappear and then you lost your planner and then like. Right. Or you think you <laughs> did put it there. And then that day comes and you didn't put it there. That would be my fear. Like that, like, oh, yeah, I would like never delete it from my email until (laughs) it was in the planner where I knew I would see it. Yeah. Okay. well, you've got my wheels turning and this doesn't need to be Sarah's (laughs) uh, Sarah Powers therapy session on to do list management. But I know people listening love to geek out about this kind of stuff, too. So I find it fascinating. Um, I want to talk about some of the tracking that you do throughout the year, because I find this so fascinating. And I'll just open with. um. I use Goodreads to track the books that I read. And I'm not, um, I, I don't read it, the quantity of books that a lot of people out there do. Like I see these people reading 50, 100 books a year. And I read 17 books in 2019, which I feel good about. It's more than one a month. Um, and I really enjoyed them all. And I, I read more fiction than I had the prior year. And that was a goal of mine. But I love that Goodreads will spit out this report at the end of the year of like, These are the books you read. Here's how many pages it equaled. And I like get so much pleasure out of that for some reason. So I wish that there was that for everything in my life. Like how many, (laughs) how many steps did I take this year? Like how many photographs did I take? Like I love, and like, you know, Instagram will do your top nine. Like I'm here for it. I'm here for all of the algorithm based, um, tracking of my behavior. And I don't know why it's so satisfying, but it is. And it sounds like you're doing some of that throughout the year with pen and paper. So tell me what you track. Well, some of it, I like some of it I like to do digital and some of it I actually like to do analog. It's funny because I actually don't use Goodreads. I probably should. I just keep a little like one like a list in my little accessory notebook that has has all my books and they're numbered. I read 38 books last year, although I think 17 is still awesome. Thank you. Um, Many years I've read (laughs) far less than that as well. (laughs) So um, like I, I just like writing them down. And for some odd reason, I've been resistant to Goodreads and really for no good reason. So maybe I should revisit that. You know what I really like tracking digitally though is workouts. (laughs) So um, Strava, I don't know if you've used Strava, but it's like a running app, but you can also record other workouts in there. And I used it religiously for 2019. Like every time I did a workout at home or when I go running, I would just use it to like track my runs. And then it's really cool. It's kind of like a top nine. They sent me like a summary of this is your 2019. This was your longest workout. This is how many hours you spent running. This is and I, I, I just love it. Love that. I know. I love <laughs> so, it all. OK, so you do workouts digitally. What else I do, do you do workouts track? digitally? But I also like I plan my workouts analog. Like I know that I will be better about meal planning, about getting my workouts done. Um, those are things. Those are actually the really main two things as I'm setting up the week ahead that I always put in, like at least what I plan to do. And then I love that satisfying checking off of the box when I've done it. Um, in addition to putting it into Strava, which maybe is overkill, but, you know, as much motivation as it takes to get me to work out <laughs> is is worth it. Yeah, totally. Um, I also um, I. I've started tracking when my kids get sick, um, which is weird because sometimes it's been depressing because I'm like, oh, my God, my two year old literally had six colds in like four months. How is that even possible? But at the same time, when I look at that, I'm like, you know what? There were 20 days last month when she didn't have a cold. That's pretty good. 
It's not like it's every single day, even when it feels like it. Um, And it helps me see that like my older kids get sick so much less often anymore. And that's kind of nice to see. And then sometimes, you know, when your child gets sick and you are like, how long have they had this? Um, If I know that I'm going to mark down like when their fever started, then I can more easily look back and like have an accurate idea. Um, And, that you know, I won't let like a week go by (laughs) without doing anything about it um, as a physician. (laughs) Just to jump it. I know you are a physician. I am medically anxious. (laughs) I'm a medically anxious person. So I have actually done that with my kids. And I'm sure the doctors either think I'm crazy or I'm a very convenient patient because once I don't do it with every time my kids get a cold, but if something seems off or like extra long, I will retroactively go back and write down. So that when I go into the doctor, I'm like, mm-hmm, it started on this day and the fever went to this. And No, you're a dream so, patient. Yeah. I love when people come in and can give accurate. In fact, there are certain problems like a menstrual disorder or headache disorders where we're like, keep a diary. We want to know specifically what's going on. So there's like this convenient table in the Japanese planner that I use that has like a, it's crazy. It's like a box for every single day of the year, basically, and multiple columns. So that's why I felt like, wow, this is just meant to be a little family illness tracker. So that's been good. Um, I track restaurants I want to try and then we'll check them off as we try them. So that's fun. That is fun. We will track off shows that we see and movies that we go to because there's something satisfying about being able to go to the end of the year and see those. And I don't keep my planners because, you know, I don't want to have a giant stack of books someday, (laughs) but I do keep that tiny accessory notebook because it takes, it takes up like no space. Like you could put, you know, probably enough for the rest of my life in like a small shoebox or something. And, um, it's really cool that I'm like, Oh, I have a record of every movie I've scene and like all that kind of thing. Do you so, ever use, yeah. so I know we're, we're recording this like at the very beginning of January. Do, do you ever use the prior year's tracking list as a starting point for setting goals for the new year? I mean, I found that very motivating, like just looking at the Goodreads list. I'm already thinking I want to read more books this year. So does that do yes. those go hand in hand, like the tracking, you know, the past into the future? Absolutely. In fact, I set my reading goal based on last year. I decided I'm turning 40, so I'm going to try to read 40 books. And if I hadn't tracked how many books I read last year, I probably wouldn't have known what a realistic number it would have been for me. So absolutely. I love looking from year to year. It's also fun like to go back and look at past workouts to be like, wow, I was really in good shape back then or not. Right. <laughs> um, so that's kind of fun yeah, to look back at. I think um, it, tracking sound, it kind of gets a bad rap. Like It sounds like obsessive or... Um, I don't know, like, like self-obsessed in a way to like write down all the things that you're doing. But I'm, I'm with you. I think it's, um, can only kind of open your eyes to opportunities or just make you feel good about yourself. We, on our little retreat, um, Brian and I wrote down, I said, I want there to be a Goodreads for television because honestly, watching good television is like a hobby of my husband's and mine. It sounds dumb. This could be this could be an an opportunity for you, Sarah. You can invent the Goodreads for. I mean, (laughs) I guess if you go into Netflix, it'll show you what you watch. But we watch we watch from all sources. So we just kind of went through and we made our list of the series that we watched in 2019, and it just feels like I don't know. There's something satisfying to um to look back and see the books you read, the movies you saw. Um, the, the restaurants you ate at. I love that one. My husband actually does keep a list of um, restaurants we want to go to. So I, I delegate that tracking to him. But um, also you're turning 40. We are the same age. I didn't realize that. I bet I'm going yes. to turn 40 before you unless you I are. think you are only by like a couple months because okay. you mentioned it in a yes. recent podcast and yes. my my math. I was like, oh, she's like three months older. <laughs> yes. Like yes. That. I'm very soon. <laughs> very a few weeks. So um, I like that 40 books goal. So um, I will think on that as well. That would be a big jump for me to go from 17 to 40. But anyway, you could do 40 of something else. 40, I, know. I don't know, Netflix series yeah. or something. 40 hours. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we could honestly talk about this stuff forever. Sarah, do you have, you mentioned the name of your planner. Are there any other favorite brands or um, I'm putting you on the spot here, but if it's not a brand, a store or an Instagram account or Um, someplace for somebody who hasn't bought a planner for 2020 yet, a place to get started looking. Oh my gosh. There are too many. I can (laughs) spout off. I'll spout off like five favorites for fun. Erin Condren, if you haven't seen her stuff, makes beautiful things. It's a big um, company based in the US. Um, A smaller company with a female CEO is Inkwell Press. She makes a Mm -hmm. lot of really beautiful planning products. I know a lot of people swear by the Emily Lay um, Simplified Planner or the Day Designer. Those are um, big products. And um, I'll name one more. There's a customized system called Agendio that if you're like a total planner nerd and you want to just make your planner from absolute scratch, 
um, like design every page, then Agendio allows you to do that. Um, actually, one more, a slightly budget option uh -huh. that also has a lot of customizability is the Plum Paper Planner. But yes, once you go down the rabbit hole, you'll see there's about a million different options. The Hobonichi is very unique. So I definitely think checking that out is, yeah. is fun, even if it's not completely up your alley. And yeah, just search planner on Instagram or there's um, a planner reviewer named Plannerisma on okay. Instagram that it's fun to follow her because she'll post reviews of various planners. It is. It's like really it's just like food or anything else where you could just dive down into the depths and enjoy looking at this stuff. I love it. And I assume um, that both of us would say that it's not so much which planner you get, but how you use it and how you go about thinking about your planning and your goals for the year and kind of making whatever system you have work for you. I know that's something Megan and I always try to leave with is like, there's no one right system, but um, the, the more you kind of find the one that works for you and then do it day after day, uh, the better the results. So absolutely. All right. Well, Sarah, remind everybody where to find you online. And of course, everything we talked about, we will link up at the momhour.com. But before we before we leave today, just remind everybody about the podcast and how to find you online um, everywhere you hang out. Yeah. So my blog is theshoebox.com. T-H-E-S-H-U-B-O-X. Shoe is my initials. So mm -hmm. kind of I love it. Name, but, um, and then I'm also at the underscore shoebox at Instagram. And my podcast, well, not my podcast that I do along with my co-host, Laura Vanderkam, is Best of Both Worlds. And we uh, publish every week and you can find us anywhere you find podcasts. Yes. It's an awesome uh, resource um, targeted toward full-time working moms, but I think part-time working moms and all moms can benefit from it. Megan and I have both been guests um, on The Best of Both Worlds. Yes, and amazing guests. <laughs> your co-host, Laura, just had baby number five. So you guys are five and three like we are, the combined eight children. So I love those parallels in our in our co hostness Awesome. Well, Sarah, believe it or not, you've just checked off my first 2020 goal of being on a <laughs> podcast that I love. So thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, it was so fun, Sarah. Thanks for being here. Okay, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Just as a reminder, everything Sarah and I talked today, as well as all of the information about our wonderful sponsors and the stuff Megan and I have going on behind the scenes, all of those links are at themomhour.com. This is Voices episode 44, and you'll see the show notes right there when you land on the homepage. Again, themomhour.com is where you will find all those great links, and Megan and I will be back with you soon. Talk to you then. Hi friends, Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Teas Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Teas Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasmade.com to find all those episodes. The Teas Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Teas Made. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour.